Hello, my name is Tammy Tucky, and welcome to my channel and this special podcast interview series. When I was a little kid, one of the scariest yet enticing, beautiful adaptations of a children's book was the 1999 NBC made for television film Alice in Wonderland. In lieu of the film's upcoming 20th anniversary, I wanted to pay tribute to one of the staples of my childhood by chatting with the film's composer, Richard Hartley, today. Welcome, Richard. I'm so glad we can talk. Thank you for inviting me. It's one of those projects that I have not been able to find any information on, like the behind the scenes of it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you were introduced to the project initially? Was it during the early stages of development? Uh, It had been developed, but it was during the early stages. Um, The producer, Dyson Lovell, invited me uh, Well, first of all, they took me to Jim Henson's workshop because that's where all the all the characters, you know, the various faces and various things that they used for animation were made. And then I had a chat with him, and uh, they hadn't started shooting because I wrote all the songs before, way before they started shooting. So, um, so I was on board quite early, and also. you know, the, the lyrics were adapted, um, you know, from um, Lewis Carroll's little poems. And so Peter Barnes gave me a whole set of lyrics. And so I started writing the songs. I think the first one was, Will You, Won't You Join the Dance? And, you know, so I made a few little changes. You know, I asked him, could we, you know, put the and and, and you know, various other things just to make things scan. And so I started writing the songs um, and then sort of did little demos of them. Um, And then one by one, I think Tina Margarina was the first person to come. Um, So they came out to my house and so she came around and I sent everybody into the garden so I played with the song. And I mean, she was amazing actually. She learned it in 15 minutes. And uh, and then one by one, all the actors. Uh, I mean, they hadn't started shooting when I did uh, when I did Tina. Then one by one, I went through the songs with the actors, um, and so then so that's how I, that's how I got involved. So it was quite a long process. I think I got involved in probably July of. Uh, 98 and then we went through we recorded probably the whole score later on probably january of 99 february uh, so it was a long haul but i have to say it was one of the most enjoyable things i've ever done there was absolutely everyone was just fantastic i mean the actors were so professional I mean, Martin Short, for instance, made some great suggestions, you know, because his was, you know, it was kind of a novelty song, and he'd already figured out, I think, how he was going to play the part, and so he was very helpful, and, you know, it was just, it was one of those great things, you know, you, you, there's not that many, in, you know, because film business and television is pretty, you know, it's pretty tough sometimes, but this was a fantastic um you know, great memories of this film. Um, and then, you know, everyone, one by one, as I said, they came um, and learned the songs. I mean, probably the funniest was Gene Wilder. You know, Gene, um, uh, he came and he, you know, and he and Donald Sinden had this duet. Now, Donald, poor Donald, can't really sing, you know, so we decided that he kind of speak a little bit of beautiful soup. And the other thing was, Donald was a chain smoker. And, you know, Gina lost his wife to cancer. And so when we recorded, you know, Donald was smoking away and so I had to get him out of the studio. And we did it bit by bit, you know, line by line, because Donald couldn't, you know, he couldn't really. So what, what we did was I went in with a piano and the, and the actors, and then we recorded them singing, and then used the piano as a guide track, you know, and then later on, I, it was all orchestrated, 
and the orchestra was added. So it was, um, that was pretty easy because they learned the songs, just went in the studio, got the performance, you know, the director came along and we just, you know, tweaked a few little things and then, uh, and then, you know, added the orchestra, well, in probably the next uh, January, February, when I did the rest of the score. So that's, that's not too convoluted, that's how I started and you make a great point because I feel like this is one of the last films that is kind of like that ensemble piece where you have all of these celebrities coming together to make their own cameos, but they're not like, how would you say it? They're not like some of those films where they're just a quick five second, 30 second cameo. Everybody has a strong piece in the film. And when you were referring to some of the original songs written by Lewis Carroll, and those were Speak Roughly to Your Boy, Twinkle Twinkle, Will You Won't You, Join the Dance, and Beautiful Soup. These were all featured in the books, just for our listeners to know. And it was interesting because I was looking back at the original books, and they had lists of all of these songs, and I kind of forgot that there were a lot. So how was it that these specific songs made the final cut as opposed to the other ones featured in the book or were there any additional songs that you worked on that were going to make it in the film and they just never got it to the finishing stages yeah there was there's only one actually that never made it to finishing christopher lloyd had a song uh on his horse um i can't remember what it was called now but i mean we recorded it um and in fact Christopher did it, we did it live. I mean, I, I taught him the song, and then um, we decided that, so I went on set and had a guitar <laughs> behind the, in the wings, and, and, you know, I played the chords and Christopher sang it. Um, uh, but then, eventually, to what, when it got to that point of the film, we thought it, well, it wasn't my decision, but it was thought that it was getting a bit too slow, so it just needed to sort of be... So we cut the song. I think he was fine about it, but, you know, that, that was the only one that went. I mean, the decision about what songs to put in were really down to the Peter Barnes, and I think Dyson worked on the script with him, so those were made before I got involved. So, But that's the only song that got cut. One of the last... If you look at that cast list, it is, I mean, the who's who of British theatre and television and film, not and the Americans as well, you know. So it um, it's probably the last of the great sort of movies of the week, you know. But uh, then it's, things changed after that, I think. And they all they were all marvellous, I have to say, to work with. You know, I mean, Gene Wilder, you know, he was absolutely great. You know, that uh, Ken Dodd, then Liz Spears, Christopher Lloyd, I mean, Martin Short, the professional, I mean, it, well, they were absolutely, I think they enjoyed themselves. Look, it's not a, so often you get a chance to partly make a fool of yourself and also be absolutely outrageous um, at, in such a short space. You know, you don't, you, you, it's, I mean, it's Miranda Richardson, for instance, is the queen, you know, she was absolutely, because I wrote, she has this march. It's a peculiar little thing, march. And, and I wrote that uh, probably ahead of time, actually. And because we used that when we were playing at NBC, because we couldn't find anything that, you know, made a, that matched a performance, you know, because it's a big performance in that film. A lot of people may not know this, but Alice in Wonderland was the second to last film that Gene Wilder starred in before his semi-retirement from the entertainment industry. So what was his initial thought process when you presented Beautiful Soup and Will You Won't You Join the Dance to him? Well, I'd, I'd sent him a demo um, of Beautiful Soup and, um, I, you know, I was slightly nervous with him, you know, because he, you know, he, he has such a track record and, you know, and he's a great comedian and this wasn't really a comedy part as such. Um, and so he, but, so when he learned the song, so when he came, when he came around to see me, he said, I said, okay, shall we, uh, I'll play that. He said, no, no, 
don't play the piano. I'll just sing it how I think I should sing it. And then you tell me, well, you know, and that's how we started. So instead of, you know, because if you, once you start accompanying someone, you, there's a tendency to guide them in the direction A that you want or whatever direction. But so I thought that was a very, very clever thing to say because he sang the song and then I said, okay, right. And then we, we didn't make any changes to it, but we made changes to the tempo and, you know, he, it became a very romantic song, which it is actually. Uh, and uh, and when he went you join the dance, he was so soft when he sang. You know, it was very, very. Uh, you know, because he could belt that song out like he has done in other things, but he didn't. You know, he just sort of. I said, "Do you want to do it?" Like he said, "Yeah." He said, "Because I think that's the way it should be." And you know, we agreed. I think it was because. With beautiful suit, it, it is. It's a bit like a sort of an operatic aria, but without, you know, reaching to the sky. Uh, and I thought he sang it beautifully, actually. And Martin Short, he also has his long note for for Twinkle Twinkle, I believe, and um, yeah. and he also gets to sing Auntie's Wooden Leg and just loud and obnoxious but I love that so rehearsal with him everybody who I've you know talked to who has worked with him says that they adore working with him because he's just so funny and he really likes to deliver on whatever role he's playing so what was that process like with him just working on it to nail it that we made a lot of changes when they were down to Martin actually <clears throat> I'd written those two songs and um he'd been filming that day not that particular uh not that particular scene, but something else. And he said during the filming, you know, he, he, he had this song in his head. And so we went into the studio and we kind of rewrote the songs in the studio, actually. I mean, we rewrote the phrasing and, and uh, you know, had a pianist there and we, you know, we got around the piano and we sort of said, well, you know, that could be a bit shorter, that longer. And so, you know, that that was one of the few times where I think... You know, he felt that he wasn't crazy enough the way that I had it originally. And he was right. I, you know, because that, you know, he was a man had to admit. He felt he could do more with it. And then, and of course, you know, he's steeped in sort of musical comedy and musical theatre. So um, I think he was absolutely right to insist, you know, he said, look, I think we can do this and that. I can't quite remember the details, but. I do. I know we were there for quite a long time. So there was just the piano. Then we did all the guide track, and then I added stuff later on. But um, he, um, because you know, he's kind of a musical comedy actor, really, isn't he? I mean, that's his. You know, he's been on. You know, he's done shows on Broadway, and you know. But he was really, you know, he was quite. He wanted to be bolder, and I think he was correct. And also with Tina, because you were mentioning that she learned the Will You, Won't You Join the Dance song very, very quickly. So did that take yeah. a couple of takes, or was that like a one-take wonder? Uh, I think, well, when we rehearsed it, because actually the director was there, her mom was there, and the two producers, and anyway, so I said, well, look, you know, you go into the garden, you know, my husband, and then mom and I said, you know, I'll just work with Tina, so... I, and they were thinking, oh, well, you know, this could take a while, so, you know, a glass of wine, a cup of tea or something. And anyway, in 15 minutes, she learned it. And she was so quick. And, uh, you know, and so when we went into the studio, she didn't, uh, I don't know, she seemed fearless. You know, some people, you put a microphone in front of them and, you know, they completely climb up. But she didn't do that, I think, uh, I don't know, and she'd not really done much before that, had she? I don't know. I don't know. No, no, uh, she had no singing credits before that either, and I thought she did a really yeah. good job. It was brilliantly cast, I think. And, you know, I think people like that, sort of, you know, they come together and and they, you know, they know that, although they're not acting in the same scenes and other, but that they know that these people are going to be giving the biggest thing they can for the, you know, for that particular part, because there's not really anything subtle in in the sense, I mean, there is, but, you know, there's, there's that joie de vivre that you get from that sort of ensemble piece, and I think, uh, I think we got that, definitely, in this film, you know, it, there's not really, 
was not a dull moment, really. I mean, and I think everyone, you know, stepped up to the plate. How long do you think that the initial score took to make for this film? Did you begin working on the score while you could see dailies and while you were visiting the set? Yeah, I did, yeah. I started uh, I started quite early, actually. The, the first cut was quite long, actually. And so, they, you know, they had to show it to NBC and, you know, you know, films are tent up, you know, the music's put on but doesn't necessarily uh, end up on the film, you know, the, there's a music editor, we had a music editor. But because of the nature of the film, he was finding it really difficult to find bits of music. And he said to me, you know, have you started writing in it? I said, yeah, I've written quite a lot. And, you know, I had quite a lot of, you know, electronic, you know, I've embraced sort of technology for uh, quite early on, you know, so... I had sort of done sort of mock-ups, orchestral mock-ups of what the things would, you know, the, the eventual cues would sound like, you know, so I could play them to people. And, and so we used a lot of those when we took sent the picture to NBC. I mean, it could have been disaster, but anyway, they, they seemed to like it, so that was, that was okay. So, yeah, so I worked on and on, you know, it probably took about four months, actually, um, to do the yeah to do the score it was uh, because of a lot of music it was interesting because when I was on iTunes, I just typed in the film and the album came up for the entire film, the soundtrack, and I was so excited I just said yes, so I purchased the whole thing because I wanted to hear it for its own self because I feel like it's its own character in the film, the score which really supports that journey into Wonderland. And I really loved listening to it just by itself, you know, not with the visuals. And I really, it's it's like this, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's like this unique type of feel for a different world that I really had never heard of when I when I was watching films around that time, 1999. So I loved listening to it again. And I just adored the, the score. And and rightly so, your score won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Music Composition for a Miniseries or a Movie, which was the dramatic underscore. So what was that like to celebrate with your fellow creative team? Because they won additional awards that night as well. Uh, no, well, actually, I was in England doing something else. So I didn't get to go to. I was doing another film, actually, uh, and we were way behind, so I couldn't really go. But I, no, I was absolutely thrilled. To be very completely honest with this, it, it did extremely well. Twenty-five point three four million people watched this film. And, you know, to have people sit down and watch something of this, of that magnitude is pretty incredible. And it it really, it really validates that with all this great reception from it, that a lot of people remember it very fondly. And I feel like, yeah. you know, with the 20th anniversary, it, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, you know? There has been a lot that has happened since. And is there any new project you're working on that we can tell our listeners about to keep an eye out or an uh, ear out for it? <laughs> well, actually, you know, at the moment I'm just involved with doing this documentary about the Rocky Horror Picture Show because uh, I was involved in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, Richard and I are writing a song for it at the moment so uh, um, <clears throat> we'll see how it goes and yeah I don't really um, I, I do quite a bit of work for that you know interviews and stuff um, but there's not another there isn't a movie on the go we have a another musical that we've written that we're working we're just finishing it off now so um, who knows <laughs> well, I'll cross yeah, my fingers for you. Yeah, thank you. And and you know, it's yeah. it's pretty crazy as the film approaches its 20th anniversary. What do you think about its overall legacy? And what would you like to say to the fans of the film? Well, I just like to thank them for for watching it for a start. But I, you know, I think although it it may seem slightly uh, old fashioned in the sense that you know it's not. Uh, you know, special effects and things like that. Of that, you know, come on. I think there's some there's a charm about this film because it keeps getting shown all over the world. 
And I think, you know, it, because of the author, the, you know, the, the, the adapter, Peter Barnes, he kept pretty close to the book. And um, I think that it has this marvelous sort of charm to it. And, and it did it, you know, and it's scary at times. But it, you know, it is the magical journey. I don't think it can ever be done again, something like this project. But I'm glad you guys did it. I'm glad you took, you took the chance, went for it, and you really put all this effort into it. So, you know, thank you for doing that. I, I really, I really do appreciate it because it is a staple in my, and in my childhood, and it always will be. So, you know, thank you so much for that. Well, that's, that's, uh, thank you. That gives me a lot of pleasure. Thank you for saying that.